have Taz make a snow angel or something, and then we'll take a picture. That'd be great. But anyway, glad you're here. Thanks for coming and um, being a part of uh, a Tuesday night. I know there's many things that you could be doing, and uh, to put a priority on the Word of God and be uh, here tonight uh, means a lot and uh, certainly encourages me, and I know it encourages your pastor, and, and I know the Lord will use his Word tonight. So I'd like you to take your Bible and go to Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians 4 tonight. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter number four. I'm going to read the verses that I want to walk through tonight. And uh, I think over the last three messages, kind of, I like to walk through the verses as we go through. But um, we're going to read these verses, and I will walk us through these verses. But I do want to kind of just paint context a little bit with the book of Ephesians and this epistle, and uh, specifically this chapter. And so we'll uh, just kind of set the context and then come back to these verses. But let's read them so that we know where we're at tonight. And that's Ephesians 4, and I want you to see verse number 25. Ephesians 4 and verse number 25. The Bible says, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Be angry and sin not. Now, before I get to these verses, and we will get here, and I want to walk through these, but I want to make sure that we recognize where we're at in the scriptures. We understand the context of this, this letter of the Apostle Paul as he writes here, of the inspiration of God, this letter to the church at Ephesus. And so he is he is teaching the church. He is addressing the church and he is admonishing and encouraging uh, the church. And specifically when you get to chapter number four, there are some fundamental truths that he is just reminding the church here of Ephesus with. He is he is he is bringing these glorious truths of the church uh, to light and making sure that the church recognizes and, and understands this institution that God has uh, created. And so he reminds us of some fundamental truths. And so let's just, let's just remind ourselves of this kind as we could and, and be reminded of these truths real quick before we get to these, these verses. Uh, first of all, go to verse number one of chapter four, because we see right off the bat that he reminds us that as a church, we have a vocation or a purpose in verse four or verse one of chapter four it says i therefore the prisoner of the lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called and so he is reminding the church that we have been given a vocation uh, we have been called to a vocation in other words we have a purpose a purpose uh, ephesians 2 and verse 8 and 9 just flip over there you'll recognize these wonderful Verses where he says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we are saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not saved by any works that we have done, but we are saved according to his mercy, right? We are saved according to what he has done on the cross of Calvary for us. And when we were saved, we were changed, gloriously changed by the grace of God. And he reminds us that, that in verse number 10 there of chapter two, he says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So he's reminding us we are saved by the glorious grace of God. We are changed by the grace of God and we are now his workmanship. We are now created uh, in Christ Jesus, and we've been created for a purpose. We have a calling, and that is unto uh, good uh, works. Uh, go to chapter 5. Just flip over to chapter 5 real quick and look at the first two verses here, where he says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. So it says we have a calling, and that's to be followers of God as dear children. We are to walk 
after Christ. So he's just reminding us uh, as a church, he's saying you have a vocation. You have a purpose. Okay. Then he reminds us of another fundamental truth here in chapter 4. And look down, if you would, in verse number 4, because he reminds us that with this vocation and calling, we have been put uh, as a part of a team. Uh, look at verse number four. He says, there is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. Okay, so this calling, this vocation, this purpose that God has given to us to walk as Christ walks, these good works that he's called us to, we are called to do them as a team. In other words, he's called us as a body here. He refers to as the body of uh, Christ. Look down at verse number 12. He speaks of this again. He says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So when we were saved, we were placed in the body of Christ. Uh, the church is that visual manifestation of the body of Christ. And we have been placed on a team. We are a part of the body of Christ. Look down at verse number uh, 25. He uses, um, he uses this uh, uh, language again in verse 25. It says, Wherefore, putting away uh, lying, speak every man the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. In other words, uh, as a church, we are connected as members because we're all part of one body. It's the body of Christ. Christ is the head and we are the members. So we are all connected because we're on the same team in Christ. We are a body and, uh, and members uh, together of that same uh, that same body. Uh, in Corinthians, he reminds the church there uh, that uh, uh, that we are members as well. And he uses the body as the illustration of uh, the importance of uh, of those members. This is our body is made up of lots of different members. We are all members of the same body, the body of Christ. So he reminds us that we have a vocation. We have a purpose, a calling. Um, he reminds us that we are a part of a team. We are a part of the body of Christ. And as members, we are all connected one of, um, one of another. But then he also reminds us here in Ephesians 4 of the fundamental truth that every member of this team has been equipped with different gifts and different roles. Um, look at verse number 7 uh, of chapter 4 here. He says, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And so uh, when you were saved, uh, you were saved by the grace of God, but then you were also gifted by the grace of God or the spirit of grace, and he has uh, gifted you. He has equipped you for this team, for this role as a part of the body of, um, the body of Christ. Uh, these are not talents that we're talking about here. Uh, these are supernatural gifts that you have only by the Spirit of God that dwells in you. And we're not just talking about uh, the older members. We're talking about uh, from the newest members all the way to the eldest members. We have all been equipped. It's not about us. It's about the supernatural work and the grace uh, of God and the Spirit of grace that equips us, gifts us, for a role within this team or within this body, uh, the church. Now, in verse number 11, he speaks of some gifts that he has given to the body. Um, you probably recognize these verses, but in verse number 11, it says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. So God here is speaking of some specific roles, some specific gifts that he has given to uh, the body for the perfecting, which means the maturing of the saints uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, edify them in the work of the ministry, in the calling that God has called us to, the vocation that he has given us. So he gives us some teachers. He gives us some pastors. Uh, he has given us some evangelists uh, to equip and to encourage and to edify in the purpose or calling that God has uh, given us. Uh, given to us. In fact, in verse number 16, I love what he says here. Uh, here's, uh, here's what all these gifts are about. In verse number um, 16, he says that 
Um, uh, chapter 4, verse 16. Let me get there. There it is. It says, from whom the whole body, I love that, the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body under the edifying of itself in uh, love. And so the purpose of the gifts is so that we might edify, supply every joint with what is needed so that the body might function in a healthy way and uh, that it might increase and uh, grow and uh, be healthy. In, in other words, what he's saying is the whole body comes together supplying one of another according to the gifts that God has equipped them with uh, so that the whole body is functioning together as a team. Um, in other words, uh, what he's saying here, every member matters. Every member. There is no, no role that is less important than another. They all work together to be fitly joined together so that they're supplying what everyone else needs so that the body as a whole might be successful, might be healthy, might be edified uh, to be able to function as God has called it to uh, function. Um, I had the privilege of playing on some sports teams. I remember those days fondly, all right? And I remember it being drilled into me that, hey, uh, no one's bigger than the team. It takes all of us. And, um, you know, for an offensive lineman, that was nice to hear, you know? That, hey, that quarterback's not throwing too many passes if uh, there's not someone blocking for him. And that running back's not scoring too many touchdowns if there's someone not making a way for him to get there. In other words, the point is it takes all 11 to move the ball down the field successfully. And it's all of them working together. And so the best teams are the ones that come together and fit together and work together to be successful in winning football games. Well, I know I'm comparing two things that do not need to be compared, all right? Uh, but the same idea goes with what he's talking about here with the church. He's saying every member of this team is important, and it is valuable, and, and God uh, has gifted and equipped. There is no role that's less important. In Corinthians, he says, one member can't say to the other member, I don't have need of you. I mean, the eye can't tell the ear, I don't want you around anymore. No, the eye needs the ear, and the ear needs the eye, and the, the hand needs the fingers, right? And, and every member, when it comes to your body, do you have any members that you're okay with just getting rid of? Don't want that toe anymore? All right, just cut it off. What, what do you need that for, right? Right? No, 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 no. We, we, we like every member of our body. And some of them are comely parts. They're not seen as much, but they're just as valuable as the ones that everybody does see, right? We, we understand, and that's the illustration God's given us, that, hey, we all have a special part of the body of Christ and the visual manifestation of that is the local church, and we're part of this team. We, we, we are needful of one another to be fitly joined together that we might, that we might supply one another with what each one needs for the increase, for the growth, to be healthy and functioning as God has designed us to function as the body, uh, the body of Christ. Okay, so what's, what's the goal then? Well, the goal is to increase, right? Verse 16, he says that. He says, the increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So God has called his church to be the light, to be the salt of the earth. Um, he has called his church uh, to a calling, a special purpose, to point a lost world to the glory and the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And so God has put his body together and he equips them by the power of the Spirit of God that they might supply one another, that they might mature, that they might grow, might be edified, so that then they might function in the calling that God has given them, and that is to be a beacon and to be a light for the truth of the gospel and the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, these are fundamental truths, and he is simply reminding the church here, 
in Ephesians of these uh, truths. Okay? And then we come to the verses that we read a few moments ago. And he says, wherefore? Wherefore? Okay. He's connecting all the fundamental truths now to what he's about to deal with. In other words, what he's saying is, because you have a vocation and a purpose, a calling, because you're a part of a team, in other words, you're a part of something that's bigger than you. You're a part of the body of Christ. And you've been equipped. You're a valuable part of this body because you've been gifted supernaturally by the Spirit of God. And you've been equipped to supply uh, the body exactly what it needs so that together you might increase, grow, mature. He's given you pastors and he's given you teachers and he's given you evangelists uh, uh, that you might grow and mature, uh, that you might uh, then function as God has designed you to be and to point a lost world to the glory of our God. So because of all this, he says, wherefore? And he reminds us that we have an individual responsibility to look to ourselves. Look what he says in verse number 22 of chapter 4 here. He says, he says that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful us, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye may put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So he's saying because of these truths about the church and what we're a part of, he says we have a responsibility to look to ourselves and to put off some things and to put on some things that we might be renewed by the Spirit of God in our hearts and in our minds. And then he really just kind of goes through a list here. This isn't my list. This is Paul's list. As he writes under the inspiration of God to the church at Ephesus. But look at the list. It starts in verse, uh, verse number 25 there. He says, Wherefore, putting away lying, Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So the first thing he says is to put off lying and to put on truth. Um, because we're a part of this team, and because we have vocation to calling, because we're a part of something so much bigger than us, it's the body of Christ. And God has given us, we have a vital role in this body. We've been equipped uh, to, uh, uh, to be a part of this body and, and to function and to healthy function that we might be that light and that salt that God has called his church to be. He says, therefore, look to yourself and put off lying and put on truth. In other words, on this team, there's no room for dishonesty. Uh, uh, there, there's no room for lying lips. We must be grounded in truth and we must speak truth. We must not twist it. We must not uh, enhance it to make ourselves look better or deceive with it. We are to not have lying lips, but we are to be grounded in uh, truth. And then he reminds us, and when you lie, or when you do not speak truth, you really only lie to yourself. Because we're all members one of another. You're only hurting yourself. Because you're part of this, of this body. In other words, the body is to be a place of transparency and honesty. It, it, it's, a, it's not a place uh, uh, for hypocrisy and lying and pretending. It, 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 it's, um, it's the body of Christ. We all be real with one another. Amen. And when we're not real, we're only hurting ourselves. Yeah, right. So he says, put off lying and put on truth. He says then in verse number 28, he says, put off stealing and put on labor. Uh, we'll get verse number um, 28 there. He says, um, he says, let him that stole steal no more but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. 
Okay, so because we're part of this team and we're because we're part of the body of Christ and we have a vocation and we have a we have a calling and, and uh, uh, because of all of uh, these fundamental truths, he says, hey, put off stealing and put on labor. In other words, this team ought be known by work, by labor. Now, what labor is he talking about? Well, I think he tells us there at the end when he says, um, working with his hands, the thing which is good, that he may have. That he may have what? That's what he's talking about. That you may have to be able then to what? Give, Give to him that needeth. Well, that's a different way to look at work, isn't it? But, but, but here's what he's saying. He's saying the work and the labor as a, as, a, as a believer in Christ, as a part of the body of Christ, is no longer about punching in, punching out. It, it, it's, it's no longer about cutting corners just to make ends, just to, just to get a job done. It's no longer about that. It's no longer about the almighty dollar, right? It's not about what you can have. What you know. No, no. He says it's about laboring and working so that you may have so that you might be able to minister. Yeah. Be more, be, be used. Yeah. Um, so he says, hey, the way you view your work. I, I, I like to apply this to every area. You know, we, we think of work as a paycheck. Not a paycheck. We do all to the glory of God. So we labor, we work hard, not for a paycheck. We work hard and we labor hard for the glory of God. Because I'm a part of something big. It's bigger than me. And yes, there's a paycheck that comes with that. And now I can be ready to be used as the Lord might lead to meet needs. It'd be a blessing. Um, I like to try to encourage our kids this way. You don't do school to get good grades. You do school for the glory of God. In other words, you work hard at school. To, to bring glory to God. And in return, in education, you'd be better used on the Lord. In other words, the reason why we do things is no longer for ourselves. The, the, the reason I labor or the reason I work or the I don't do it here anymore, my mind is thinking about here. So put off the stealing. Stealing happens when we're focused here. Cheating happens when we're focused here. Cutting corners, doing a half-hearted job, that, that, that focuses here. When you're focused here, and you're focused here, then that changes. And it's about labor, it's about work. And so he says, put off stealing, put on labor. Uh, then he goes on in verse number 29 and says, uh, put off corrupt communication and put, off, put on edifying speech. Look what he says in verse uh, number uh, 29. It says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Uh, in other words, your words matter. And they matter so much that it says, let none, no corrupt communication proceed from your mouth. Okay, what's corrupt? What, what meets the definition of being corrupt? Well, I think he answers that. He says, let no corrupt communication rise in your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So what he's saying is, if what you say is not ministering grace unto the hearers and edifying, then it falls into what? Corrupt. Corrupt. So in other words, because we have a vocation and because we're a part of something and the body of Christ and be ministering one to another, he says, then there's no room for corrupt communication. Yeah. We've got to put those words away. Yes. Whether we're saying them, whether we're typing them, whether we're texting them, they're all the same. Words matter. What you say matters. And God wants our words to be filled with things that will administer grace and encouragement and edifying building up others in the truth of God's word and the grace of God. And so on this team, put off corrupt communication, put on edifying speech. 
And then he says in verse 31, and I'll get to the point of the message here in a minute, almost done. Look at verse 31. He says, put off bitterness, put on forgiveness. He says in verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And I got to tell you that many times the work of God has ceased or has been crippled because of bitterness. Bitterness has prohibited the light to shine or has kept the church from being the salt that God has designed his church to be. There is nothing more corrosive in a heart, but also in a family, in a church, or in the body of Christ than bitterness. And he gives the ingredients to bitterness here. They all make up bitterness, but he describes anger. Um, when he speaks of anger here, he's talking about an anger that um, you're just not able to let something go. You just can't let go of it. You might think you've let it go, but as soon as it comes back up or, uh, or uh, something reminds you of it, then it's right like you're right there again. Like it's, just, it's right back in the present. You just, just can't let it go. He then describes clamor here. Clamor uh, just simply means a cry for justice. Uh, means I want everyone to know how wronged I've been. So we, uh, we want to take that matter to everyone else. And we cover that up with a lot of things. And we can even make it sound spiritual, like we're asking for prayer for someone. But really it's clamor. It's really a cry for justice. We want others to know how someone has wronged us. And listen, we live in a world with lots of wrongs. And I'm not going to argue that we haven't been wrong. We've all been wronged. But clamor is when we want everyone to know of that wrong. And then he goes into evil speaking, because that's where it always goes to. We end up slandering evil speak. Slander evil speaking has this idea of bringing someone down in the mind of another. So you might think this way of this person. And I'm going to speak in a way that hopefully will bring him down in your mind. I want to lower your thinking of that person. And so I slander or evil speak. Now it's not even about the situation anymore. Now it's, now it's a personal slander, evil speaking. And God says this is all bitterness. This is all traced back to bitterness. And this doesn't just hurt you. This hurts the body. This hurts those around you. Hebrews 12, 15 says, Looking diligently, lest any man, um, uh, lest any man uh, uh, of the, uh, fall from the grace of God, lest a root of bitterness, he says, springing up. And then it says, defile you or trouble you, whereby many then be defiled. So in other words, he says, beware. Hey, listen, be careful of that root of bitterness. What, what, where's a root found? That's under surface, right? And so we've got to look diligently to ourselves. In other words, we've got to go, search me, oh God. Be aware. Don't let a little root of bitterness because those roots then, what? Spring up. And in that springing up, then all of a sudden that anger and that clamor and that evil speaking, and not only are you troubled with it, but now many are defiled by it. Can I just remind you that this team isn't really about me? So this is, this is about the souls of men. Yeah. This is about the glory of God. Amen. This is about something so grand, so grand. And yet here he's warning, listen, that bitterness, man, it can, it can quench the working of God. And it can, it can quench uh, the work that God wants to do it affects the whole team and so rather than choose to hang on to bitterness he says choose to be kind choose to be soft-hearted towards those that have wronged you choose to forgive why would i ever do that because god for christ's sake hath forgiven you yes, so the motive and the example is our savior who has forgiven me 
of all my sin. And so he says, put off bitterness and put on a forgiving spirit. And that then leads me to the one that I skipped. You probably noticed that. I skipped the verses that we first read because that's where I want to close here tonight. So look back, if you would, now at the last one. Verse 26. He says, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. So he is saying to put off apathy and put on anger. That's what he's saying here. Say, wait a minute, I thought you just... It just said over here to, to put off anger, right? And clamor and evil speaking. But up here he's saying to put on, to put on anger. Now I know these verses oftentimes get used at marriage conferences and, and uh, tell uh, couples, hey, this, this verse is about not going to bed still angry at each other. Make sure that you always make things right. You know, don't lay your head in the pillow, you know, when you're still angry. Don't let the sun go down upon that. Make sure that you work those things out before you go to bed. And that may be a great practice for every marriage to, to, to follow. But that's not what it's talking about in Ephesians 4. The context is not marriage. It is the church. He is not saying to put off angry. He's saying to put it on. Right? He's saying, be angry. I don't know how you can not, uh, not you can't twist that too much. I mean, it says be angry. Okay? What are we to be angry at? Be angry and sin not. In other words, we ought remain angry about sin, not apathetic towards sin. I'll say, well, I got that down. I am sick and tired of the sin that I... No, no, okay, let's wait. Let's remember context. It's easy to get sin, uh, get angry at the sin that's out there. That's no problem for any of us. We can get all worked up about the world's sins tonight. And we know how to preach them till we're red in the face and we'll amen them till the sun comes up. But that's not what he's saying to be angry at here. Why are we shocked when the lost world acts lost? The sin that should make us angry is not the sin out there. What he's calling us to be angry about is the sin that comes in here. He's already given us the list. And when those sins, when that flesh comes in and takes control and leads to that, that bitter spirit, that anger, that evil speaking, that corrupt word, oh, that all made us angry. And make us angry to the place we repent and make it right. Turn from it. Leave it be. Let it go. Turn from it. Why? There's too much at stake here. Don't grow apathetic towards sin in your life. Stay angry about that sin in your life. And repent of that. Change mind about that. And move forward in the grace, the grace of God. Because when we get apathetic about sin, we are giving place to the devil. Well, the word place there means, kind of has the idea of giving a little space, a little room. In other words, the devil is looking for any way possible to derail the work of God. I want to remind us, this isn't about me. I tell you, the devil really doesn't care about me. He doesn't care about my marriage. And he doesn't really care a whole lot about Albury First Baptist Church or what you do. But what he does care about is the church impacting a lost world. That he cares about. And he wants to do anything possible to derail. Now, the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. Right. I know I hear people all the time that, well, this is a threat to our fundamental faith. and This is a threat to the church. Listen, there is no threat to the church tonight. Amen. 
There is nothing for us to be all up in arms about saying that's the threat to the church. No, the gates of hell are not even a threat to the church. But the threat to the church is this. And he knows it. And so he's looking for just a space on this team. If he can just find a little gap on this team. And if that's a teenager, he can get in and add two towards parents. He'll take that space. If he can get a little corrupt communication through this heart and misunderstanding and get some gossip going, he'll take He'll take that space. If he can use your marriage, he'll take that space. Because he's looking for any way to derail this team. And we're all members of one body. Sure. And what's going on in your heart affects the body. Amen. What's going on in your marriage and your heart and your life affects the the whole body, and it affects the function and the growth and the maturity of that body going together. So here's what he's saying. He's saying, listen, we all have a personal responsibility to stay on guard and to not grow apathetic towards sin in our own life. It's not my job to judge you or for you to judge me. I'm, I am to look right here. He is my judge. He is my Lord. He knows. And so when these sins come, it should bother. I should be sensitive to them. And immediately before the sun goes down, I'm going to say, Lord, I do not want to go that route anymore. I am turning from that. I am repenting of that. I know you've already forgiven me of it. It's already under your blood, but I don't want to live in that more. Now, I don't want to give space. I don't want to give a place for the devil to get in and ruin what you, your work and your glory is all about. So put off apathy and put on anger when it comes to our flesh and those sins that can so easily beset us. Remember when Jesus was in the garden and he was... Uh, praying and he wanted his disciples to pray with him. Remember that? And he comes back and he finds them asleep. And this is what he says to them. He says, watch and pray, Matthew 26, 41, that ye may enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And it's a good thing for me to always be reminded my spirit's very willing tonight. I want to be all that God would have me to be. But I also have a flesh that's weak. And I've got to keep this body under subjection. Lest that by any means I preach to others, I myself can become a castaway. I, I, I don't want to grow apathetic towards a sin right here. I want to stay compassionate towards the sinners out there. And I want to stay angry at the sin that comes right here. Like I said, I, I've gotten to be a part of a few sports teams. When I graduated high school, I decided to go to college to, to try to play some football. I, I really fell in love with playing football. I always had plans of serving the Lord, and, and um, it was called to preach when I was younger. But, uh, but I wanted to see, see if I could play a little college football. And so I, I, uh, I, I, got, uh, I got on a team, and as a freshman, uh, this team had been pretty good uh, back in Wisconsin there and, and uh, had done quite well. I didn't really expect. I thought it would take me a little bit. I thought I even bought red shirting or whatnot. But, uh, but of course, through the, through, the, um, through the preparation for the season, injuries started happening. And I had, I had been recruited to play defensive line. And so that's where I was. And they had a stack of these lines, and I really didn't expect to play. But the offensive line was having all kinds of injury problems. And so I remember that after the practice when the coach uh, – on the offensive side came over with the defensive coordinator and said, John, have you ever thought about playing some offensive line? Well, I played some offensive line in, in high school and I didn't mind that. It wasn't my choice. It wasn't really where I wanted to play, but said, we could really use you and this might be a chance for you. To, you know, defensive line, you might as well redshirt. You're probably not gonna see any time, but if you wanna get on the field this year, offensive line, you could probably play. And so I said, well, I wanna play. You know, if I can help the team, I wanna play. So uh, I'll, I'll move to offensive line. So they moved me over to offensive line and. Long story short, first game of the year, I'm starting right guard. And so I'm a right guard, and, and, um, and I know they might find this hard to believe, but I am, I am a pipsqueak compared to the other guys on this offensive line. I know, I'm, not, I'm pretty hefty now, but, but um, um, these, guys, these guys were 
made me look very, very small. The, the, the left tackle was a senior. His name was Jeremy. He was 6'4 and weighed about 320. And uh, then the center, uh, the center, he was 6'2 and weighed about 310. And uh, the, on the other side, uh, they were even bigger. And I was in the middle. When I played, uh, I played at 5'7 uh, uh, with my shoes on, and I weighed 185 pounds. Now, when I moved over into offensive line, they started to try to put weight on me, and they did. They got me up to 210 by the first game. So I was weighing 210, and I, I was 5'7". The defensive tackle I was going against was 6'2", 280. So guess where you think the, uh, you know, when they're making game plans, where, where do you think they might be able to, you know, I mean, I, I was, man, I was nervous. I mean, I was super nervous. I'm like, this is going to be terrible. Like, I'm not ready for this, you know. And, and uh, man, I'll never forget our coach. They were just really trying to help. He said, listen, we got your back. You know, this, everything's going to be, we're going to help you with that guy. We're not asking to block you alone. Just do your part. Everybody do their part. We'll work together. We've got a game plan. We've got a plan, John. It's going to work. It was a road game, so that was good. So we wouldn't have too many fans there. I wouldn't have to be embarrassed uh, in front of. And so, uh, man, we got on this uh, bus, and we pulled in there, and, and they got in there, and we went out, and, and they go out there. And then we come in for the kind of the, 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 the pump-up speech or whatever. And the offensive coaches get us together, and he says, all right, here's what we're doing. He says, I, I have scripted our first 15 plays. He said, the first drive, he said, we're doing nothing but running the ball right at their greatest strength, which is the right side. They have the tackle there, and they have a DN. This is their two best players. They're not expecting this. We're coming right at them. I'm thinking, that's my side. What are you talking about? You're, we're coming right at them. I mean, I, uh, you know, this, this, this isn't worth it. So he says right off the he says, John, I'm telling you, we're coming right, right behind you. We've got you. You just, you just block. Do your job. Man, we go out there. I mean, I'm the first one. I mean, I'm like shaking going up to the line on the first call. First call, I'll never forget it. It was, uh, it was a kick out. And, and uh, so uh, the, the, the tackle was actually going to come down and take that, that uh, big D tackle on this side. And then I was supposed to swing out and uh, cut behind him. And I was going to try to blindside the, the D in who would be cutting in. And the running back was going to just run right off my hip. And so I'll never forget that. And so uh, that, that ball, had, and I quickly turned. One thing I did have is I was quick. I was much quicker than them, and I was small. That guy was so tall, he looked right over. He never even saw me. And I just put my helmet right in his number and kicked him out on his can. And I mean, the running back took off, went for about 20 yards. It's like, I got this. We got this. We got this, you know. And so we get in there. He runs another running play. We go for five yards. Then we go for six yards. Then we went for three. Then we went for like that. I mean, we went all in. And they ran every play. It took us eight plays. Eight plays, first drive, scored a touchdown, going through the two gap. That's, that's between me and the center. And we scored. And I mean, I'm on cloud nine. I'm like, this is incredible. Oh, this is wonderful, you know. And, and uh, man, we're high-fiving all that. Well, then it's time for the extra point. Now, most of the times, you know, starting offensive line doesn't have to do the extra point. They run off. Special teams comes in. Problem is, I was first string, second string, third string, and special teams right guard. I was the only right guard that was left, you know, with all the injuries. I, I had no business being there. So I was the special teams guy. Well, I'm just all excited about the, the touchdown, you know, and, and I'm just kind of on this. Well, it's, it's just the extra point. I mean, there's not really much to do on extra point. You lock ankles on all sides there. At the snap of the ball, you basically just have to guard just the, just the inside gap. My job was just the inside gap between the center and the guard, and uh, nobody, I mean, it's not going to get through there, you know, I and mean, it's just too quick. It's only a couple of seconds, and, and so I'm just kind of standing there, and man, I'm just thinking about that touchdown. I was like, we got this. We're going to win this game, you know, and, and I'm thinking about that, and, and all the moment, and that crowd is silent, you know, and, and they never expected that, you know, and, and that ball snaps, and as the ball was getting ready to be snapped, in just a split moment, I noticed that their inside backer, Number 52. And he started coming towards my kind of inch north in my line. I said, oh, man, he's going to do something stupid. He's going to try to come through this gap, whatever, you know. And, and so I just kind of did a little, you know, like this. And out of the corner of my eye, that guy made a beeline straight to me. And he left his feet. And the crown of his helmet was the last thing I saw. This is before they really cared about this. Nowadays, yeah, this wouldn't have happened. But... But I mean, he left us the crown of his helmet, and the crown of his helmet hit me right here. And he hit me so hard. It's what our coaches used to call a slobber knocker. 
And that just means that the slobber, all of the slobber in your nose and your mouth just all comes out into your face mask at one time. I mean, it was just a slobber knocker. And I mean, when he hit me, you know, it just goes everywhere. And I mean, he hit me so hard, he knocked me backwards. And he knocked me backwards into our kicker, and I literally blocked the extra point with my backside. Now, I don't remember that part because he knocked me clean out. And I'm laying on the ground. And the coaches are over and they're like, wake up, you know, what just happened? You know, I was like, well, you blocked our extra point. You know, I was like, the, I was like, what just happened? And you know what? All the momentum just went boom, all the other side. I mean, the crowd's going nuts. I mean, you've watched some football. Have you ever seen a guy, a right guard, get knocked into his kicker like that and block his own extra point? I mean, that just doesn't happen. It happened that day. That crowd got to see it. And I mean, they were, and all the momentum, all the momentum was gone. Why? Because there was a little space. And I didn't take that space. I took it for granted. I looked down my guard. I got proud. We're on a team. This is so much bigger than us. It's about the glory of God. It's about the souls of men. And God has equipped us. He's put us together. He has put a visible manifestation of the body of Christ in Albury, Big Sandy, on this mountain, right here. You're connected as members to equip one another, to supply one another, to be and to function as God has designed you, to be a light and a salt. So therefore, take the responsibility seriously to look right here. Stay angry at sin in your own life and sin not. Or thank you so much for this, uh, these reminders of these fundamental truths of the church and the body of Christ that, Lord, by your grace, we are so privileged, Lord, to have a part of. And Lord, to think of tonight that your Holy Spirit, or your person, resides in us and has gifted us and equipped us. And Lord, there is a role that you have for us in the vocation, the calling that you have given to us to be the light, to be the salt of this earth. And so, Lord, I pray that you help us to take that matter seriously. Lord, to be conscious, to, to look in our hearts, to have that heart like David that just came in sincerity and humbleness and said, Lord, search me, know my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me. Lead me in the way of everlasting. Lord, may that be our heart tonight. And Lord, when that sin is revealed, when those things come into our lives because of our flesh that is weak, Lord, may we be so angry that we do not hang on to them. We do not allow them. We don't even allow the sun to go down upon them. We turn from them, repent of them, make those things right Make that there's no place, no space given for the devil to infiltrate your work in this place. So, Lord, I pray that you'd help us in Jesus' name. With heads bowed and eyes.